Hello, welcome once again to the teaching series, The Jesus That John Knew. We've been studying together from John chapter 5 and thinking about the story of the healing of the man by the pool. Now, perhaps you'll remember that we've seen this context where we talked about this man that was an invalid and this man that was invalidated. And he, together with a whole sea, an army, if you like, of blind and paralytic and lame people, were looking for something on the outside to deal with a problem that was really rooted on the inside. And of course, Jesus has moved into this situation and he's brought this healing. But this healing has only affected the one man, the man at the pool, as we know, that had been there for 38 years. Now, the invalidation of this one man and the blindness of the company in which he lived is only half the story. Uh, Jesus is really going to use it almost as a kind of uh, a smoking gun to lead us to the real part of the story that he wants, to t- that he wants us to see. Uh, and John's going to follow this now. As Jesus has absented himself, the man is now st- stood with his, his bed over his back. Uh, he's upright. He's walking. He's essentially, this man is healed. Now, remember this. The scene as it shifts, and we'll see the shift in the scene in just a moment, moves from this physical infirmity, this physical inability to walk, to this spiritual inability to walk. And now the contrast is going to be between walking after the flesh and wanting to make oneself righteous by the law, and walking in the spirit, knowing that one has been made righteous by grace. Uh, And in addition to that, we're obviously going to have this context of blindness come fully into focus where we've seen the physical blindness of his compatriots and now we'll see the physical blindness or indeed the spiritual blindness of religion. So the blindness of the Jews in this story manifests itself in in the inability to see beyond the fact that this healing took place on a Sabbath. And for them, this Sabbath infraction is altogether more outrageous than the healing is amazing. And of course, Jesus is challenged to them, and this is a deliberate conflict, because he could have healed this man on any day of the week he chose, but he chose to heal the man on the Sabbath day. He chose the engagement with him. He chose to take them head on in this Sabbath conflict, in, in a miracle, incidentally, which he initiated. Remember, it's not a response. This is not a, a miracle that is in any way solicited. This man uh, doesn't have any clue about the prospects of Jesus healing him. Jesus introduces that into the narrative. So the, the Jewish context is that you have the rest on the Sabbath, rest from works. And of course, in a, in a works environment where you work yourself to the point of exhaustion, the reason why you rest is in order that you can do more works, quite obviously. But Jesus' point is going to be, no, we don't rest, we don't rest from work. That's a misunderstanding, that's a misnomer. We work from rest. Now, it's a very different proposition to teach someone that they work from rest than it is to teach they rest from work. So the Jews have this sacred day, the Sabbath. And this Sabbath day is sacrosanct. And you cannot do any work on the Sabbath at all. And Jesus seems to go out of his way in the Gospels to do Sabbath works, to work from rest on the Sabbath. And it creates a hiatus, terrible problems, as, 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 we'll, as we'll see. But it's the spiritual blindness I want to get hold of just very quickly. Uh, because let's, let's just hear what, um, the, what the, the, the response to the miracle. John chapter 5, and, and we have verse uh, 9 before us. And at once, the Bible says, the man was healed, and he took up his bed and he walked. Now that was the Sabbath day. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath day, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them and said, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Well, now let's be clear about something, because we're going to see a very similar uh, engagement uh, between uh, another healed man in John chapter 9, and this is the healing of the man born blind with the Pharisees, a very similar problem. The man who did it, he told me, he told me to. But I want you just to see very quickly this 
this epidemic, this, this uh, religious epidemic that is spiritual blindness. In Acts chapter 28, Paul is at the end of Luke's account of Paul's uh, traveling ministry says that uh, he calls together all of these, the, the Jews come to meet with him, and there's a, some accept the teaching, some dispute the teaching. But then Paul says this, thinking of the words of Isaiah. The Holy Spirit, he says, Acts 28, I'm looking at verse 25, the Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through the prophet Isaiah, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull. With their ears they can barely hear, and they have closed their eyes, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. Now that is exactly what we see in this scene around the pool of Bethsaida. What we have is we have seeing but not perceiving, hearing but not understanding. But this, this man, this, this, this outcast, this man has heard and he's received and he's been healed. So that is our context, an important context it is too. But let's just step back a minute to the, to, to our, the plight of our man. Remember now, for 38 years, he's, uh, he, he's, he's been an invalid. So for the first time in almost four decades, the man is able to stand on his own two feet. Now let's, let's hold on to this thought a minute. I want you to put yourself in his shoes, or rather put yourselves in his dirty feet. He's standing there, free as a bird. He's alive. He's been raised from the dead. He, he, he stands, he's well, he's whole. And it's possible that he's just savoring this incredible moment. And maybe he's been saved for like 3.8 seconds. And then Jesus says something to him that will cost him his life. Jesus says to him, Now, pick up your bed and walk. <laughs> You've got to be clear you understand this. It's a Sabbath day. The man knows about the Sabbath rules. He's lived outside the temple, but the, 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 the sheep gate for 38 years, he gets it. There is a law, and he knows it very well, that if anyone carries anything in public on the Sabbath day, he deserves death by stoning. That's <laughs> Without thinking about it, and maybe if he did think about it, that would have caused him a problem. Oh, and incidentally, just by the by, one of the greatest problems that I, I think I see in this problem of living life in the Spirit is that we try and think too much, and we try and know too much. The, the rule of living in the Spirit is not to learn to think, it's to learn to concentrate. Martha was distracted, the Bible says, by so many different things, but we need to learn to concentrate. And the man was concentrated on what Jesus had said to him, and then Jesus said to him, pick up your mat. And so the man just picked up his mat. Now understand something, immediately he picks up his mat, he becomes the New Testament type of the Old Testament Abraham who took his son, his only son, at the call of the Lord and took his son out to what? To sacrifice him. From that moment he picks up his bed, he knows that he's as good as dead. He knows it. There he's standing with his bed and he begins to walk. So let's just hold that scene. You, you, you've got to almost grasp the <gasps> of it as this, as this man is walking in, on a Sabbath with, with his bed in, the, in broad daylight, right in the middle of all of this kind of Jewishness, this kind of legalism, this kind of thou shalt notism, this thou ought not toism. <laughs> so it's hard to imagine a piece that's been more highly choreographed than this. So it's, it's divine mischief. Now watch with me. So here, here he goes. Uh, it is, it's an absolute irony, isn't it? Because 
here we have this situation that Jesus is saying uh, that they, their, their burdens are so heavy they put on people that his, his burden is, is easy, his yoke is light. And here, here, is, here is this man now with, with what you might think is a burden and he walks across, he walks out of the pool of Bethsaida and he begins to make his journey. Now, now what's interesting is this, is that this man is perhaps more of an Adam than he is an Abraham because of course when he's confronted he's not going to uh, speak a word of faith he's going to speak a word of well I don't know actually thinking about this is he going to speak a word of faith or is he going to speak a word of obstinance I, I think he's going to speak more a word of fear if the truth be known not like our man in John chapter 9 who speaks obstinately to him this is, this is very interesting because I think what this guy does is I think this guy more kind of passes the buck so let's, let's have a look let's, let's see what happens well so the Jews said to him verse 10 uh to the man who'd been healed. It's the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to take up your bed and walk. But he answered them, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Hold on just a second. The man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, well, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? And the man who had been healed said he didn't know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn and there was a crowd in, in the place. So now the man's saying, I, I don't know. All I know is this guy told me to pick up my bed and walk, and I just walked. Now, understand this. This story's not finished. This is Jesus is laying the trap, and our guy's the bait, and Jesus is going to draw them in in just a second. Now, I just want to tee you up for where we're going to head to next week when we get into more into the story. But just see that. The guy is standing there. The first time in his life, he's, he, he's, he's been, he, or the first time in 38 years, he's been standing his own two feet. Now watch the real irony. Watch this. Verse, uh, where are we now? I think about it. Verse 13. Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, but Jesus had withdrawn and there was a crowd in this place. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him again, Ah, see, you are well. Sin no more, for nothing worse happens to you. Now, I'm going to just leave that hanging. But one of the things I do want to leave kind of just reverberating in your mind until next week is this. This man, where is he? He's in the temple. And part of me thinks to myself, Jesus has gone to him and said, Listen, I didn't save you for this. <laughs> you can't understand. I saved you for something greater than this. You've left one pool surrounded by a load of invalidated people to join another group of people who are trying to invalidate themselves as well. This is not the gospel message at all, my friend. Now, I've got something for you to do, and it's something serious. Now, listen to me. And Jesus will then talk to him and explain this to him. And we've got some problems because we've got this very tricky verse about sin no more, that something worse, worse may happen to you. I want to try and treat that next week. But let me hold that till next week because it will take a few moments to explain it to you. In the meantime, thank you for watching. God bless you and have a great week. Bye.